Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar about how to manage compliance and risk in changing in a changing global trade landscape, brought to you by the Institute of Export and International Trade in partnership with GW Consulting International, or GWCI, and the Bletchley Group. My name is William barnes Graham, the Executive Editor at the Institute, and I will be your host for today. And I'm delighted to be bringing you today's webinar on such an important topic. Over the last few years, we've done multiple sessions around things like customs compliance, which is, of course, very important, particularly in a post-Brexit landscape. But today, we're going to be looking at other areas of compliance and risk, which internationally trading businesses need to be aware of throughout their supply chain, whether that's compliance with sanctions, ESG reporting, or insurance compliance with things like anti-bribery or anti-corruption rules. And we'll be looking at how businesses can go about monitoring and mitigating these risks, including through insurance options. To begin with though, on the next slide, it is my delight to introduce our excellent panel of speakers today. There's going to be two distinct parts to this webinar and in the first half, we're going to be hearing from GWCI about the importance of conducting proper due diligence on your supply chain partners. Graham Welland is the CEO at GWCI with more than 30 years experience of working with regulators and auditors in highly regulated industries. He founded the Risk and Compliance Consultancy in 2017, which has supported businesses in over 140 countries. Simon Dexter is the Global Head of Sales at GWCI, who also has vast experience, having worked or lived in almost 50 different countries across a variety of different sectors. For the second half of the webinar, on the next slide, we're delighted to be joined by Angela Irvine, the Sales Director at the Bletchley Group, a chartered insurance broker with 30 years experience in the insurance sector, supporting a wide range of businesses from SMEs to multinationals. Victoria Gibson is a customer risk consulting lead at Zurich Resilience Solutions, or ZRS, with experience in risk management in both public and private sectors uh, as a practitioner, facilitator, and consultant. We'll then have Namdi Ahujogu, who is a specialist risk engineer also at ZOS with over 20 years experience in various supply chain functions. We're looking forward to hearing from all three of them later on in the webinar. And we're also looking forward to hearing from both GWCI and the Bletcher Group about how members of the Institute can benefit from the services that they are providing as part of the membership benefit package at the Institute. But on the next slide, before we get into the meat of things today, we're going to run a quick poll to find out a little bit more about you, our audience. So this one is asking, which of the following best describes your approach to conducting due diligence on international partners? And the options uh, include conducting it pre-entering a new market or business relationship, doing it on an ongoing basis, doing it on a needs must basis, or maybe you haven't conducted any due diligence before, you may even not be sure. So I'll leave that poll open for a few seconds. While you're answering that poll, just some the usual housekeeping notes for me. Firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel on the control window, which is usually to the right hand side of your screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions today, though please note we cannot guarantee we will get to every question in the allocated time. As such, I will be prioritizing questions that have relevance to the wider audience, so I won't be going into company or sector specific queries as, as such. And please note that if your questions are short and clear, I am more likely to be able to read them. Finally, you will receive a recording of the webinar with a copy of the slides and a follow-up email we will be sending over the next day or so. But thank you everyone for responding to that poll, going to share the results. So uh, revealing as ever, uh, a quarter of you do it before entering a new market or business relationship, 45% of you do it on an ongoing basis, only 5% of you do it on kind of need, needs must basis. 12% uh, of you haven't conducted it before. So a bit of a spread there in terms of how businesses on this uh, particular webinar are currently doing uh, their due diligence. However, thank you everyone for answering that poll. It definitely sets the scene for us, our first speaker in Simon Dexter from GWCI, who's going to cover the importance of due diligence in a changing risk landscape. So on the next slide, over to you, Simon. And thank you very much, Will, and uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the importance of due diligence in a changing risk landscape. I'm Simon Dexter, and what I'd like to do is assist you in understanding more of the world of due diligence, giving you some hints and tips 
as to what you should be looking out for and giving examples of what I've faced in my career in the world of export, the red flags, how to assess your third parties and why we should bother to even engage in due diligence. Now, it's very rare that I don't meet someone who thinks due diligence is very important. But sadly, it's also very rare to see people delve deeply into it. I don't know why this is. In my experience, is it that the sale or profit margin is more paramount? Or are we all assuming that someone else in the supply chain would have done it? And therefore, anything would be fine. Or is it just the thought that a simple credit check will do? Now, I've been an export sales manager for over 30 years and nothing really surprised me in the world of export. I've got a real passion for it, and I've been at the cold face of the export world, like I'm sure many of you. I've researched my distribution partners, my agents, my direct partnerships, and then been to visit them in numerous countries across the globe. I've been involved in the DIY industry, agricultural industry, pharmaceutical industry, and financial services. I've seen corruption sadly firsthand. I've been offered bribes. I've sat down to lunch with criminals, I would hate, hate to say unknowingly, I've had meetings that interrupt with calls to government personnel relaying just how much was needed to get a contract. And I've sadly seen several instances of theft and fraud. I would counter this by saying I've also met some very nice distributors, agents and businesses without whom I would never have grown my turnover and made a good profit. Now, I am a member of the Institute of Export and I have benefited from their services and advice as well. Can we have the next slide, please? So what I'd like to do over the next 15 minutes is to highlight why proper due diligence is really important in today's ever-changing world of export and to help you understand the way you can go about it, often for minimal cost. Now, as a business, whether that's manufacturing or services, we're very much aware of what we want in terms of profit margins and the need to achieve sales in our given markets wherever they are across the globe. I would add that the need to protect the business's reputation is equally important and that fundamentally we need to know as much about our potential partners before engaging with them. Now, for years it was thought that a simple credit check to show their financial worth was adequate. And yes, to be honest, in the main, this tended to work, coupled with some checks on references. But in this ever-changing, fast-moving world in which we now face, that is just enough, not enough. It's vital we fill in as many pieces of the jigsaw to get as clear a picture as possible before engaging. As an exporter, you do your desk research, you do your field visits into country. You meet your proposed partners, but that is not enough anymore. You should also be doing your due diligence regularly, as a minimum checking to make sure there are no sanctions or they're not on any watch list or they're not politically exposed persons. Now I say as a minimum, because these days you should, you should also be looking at criminality, bankruptcy, checking company registrations and any adverse media. And with ESG, the buzzword for 2023, also looking at the environmental stance, human trafficking, modern slavery, in fact, anything and everything that could cause reputational damage to your business. The reality is there are laws coming into place in the next few years which will make us do all these things. And we want to be ahead of the game, don't we? As of January the 1st this year, the German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act came into place. The goal to understand any potential and actual human rights and environmental risk in the supply chain of companies. And it's currently going through the EU, a directive the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive on Supply Chain. Now, at first glance, this looks as if it only covers very large companies. But in most large company supply chains, there are smaller companies that potentially, if they're not doing their due diligence properly, could be the Achilles heel for that large company, or potentially themselves lose their contracts to supply that large company because they hadn't heeded the directives coming through. Now, to be fair, 10 years ago, we probably wouldn't be talking like we are now. In the next couple of years, we don't have a choice. That's why we want to be ahead of the game. The speed of communication on Twitter, threads, and other social media shows just how quickly reputations can be tarnished and lost. It takes years to build a reputation, but seconds to lose one. Next slide, please. So why can third parties be risky? Well, working with third parties actually offers tremendous benefits. They know the market. They can act on your behalf and normally based in country, giving a real local insight. But there's always a the risk and it is necessary to mitigate that risk by understanding and investigating as much as possible about those third parties, as you could leave yourself open to many unpleasant consequences from legal to reputational to financial. And in some cases, yes, personal liability. If you're trading overseas, then you should be aware of the legal ramifications as anti-bribery and corruption legislation still heavily rules this area, the UK Bribery Act. 
and the US Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. But focus is also shifting towards the environment, modern slavery, adverse media, in order to understand the reputational impact. Legally, and I'm not a lawyer, companies, though, can be held liable for the acts of third parties, even if they were not aware of their actions. You've only got to read Section 7 of the UK Bribe Act to see that. That's why it's so important that when you're dealing with third parties, you check they are who they say they are, that they're registered correctly, so you can make sure you're, in, in simple terms, invoicing the right company. Review and check the websites. Ask lots of questions not just about how they're going to make a sale or how they're going to market your goods or services. You may conclude that refusal or resistance to answering this may cause a, be a cause for concern. Certainly think twice before making any payments and do not send anything if you have any doubts. Next slide, please. So there's red flags out there, but what exactly are red flags? Well, red flags are not necessarily an indicator that anything untoward will occur but the identification of one or more red flags raises the risk profile of that relevant third party and should pique your interest to find out more about the personal company. Types of risk you may want to consider. Geographic risk, business partner risk, public sector risk, contractual risk. Some examples that the third parties are reputation in the market for corruption or an otherwise unsavory reputation. Naturally, they're not gonna volunteer this information to you. Be aware that there's also a geographic risk with operations in sensitive and high risk countries. And sometimes a third party would request unusually high commission or large non standard fees. These are all red flags. The transaction may involve unusual contract terms or payment arrangements, such as requests for payments in cash or classic one special invoices. Now, as I said, I've been an export a long time. I've been asked frequently to add 10% to invoices for marketing services. 10% to invoices marketing services. Very interesting, but we don't propose any marketing services. This was clearly a money to pay a bribe. Needless to say, we refused. You need to check whether people have a family relationship with a public official or government agency or are otherwise politically exposed. They may have investors or beneficial owners that were not disclosed. They may describe a special relationship or influence with government officials. These are all red flags. Other examples where there's pressure to make payments urgently or ahead of schedule, poorly documented invoices, including vague descriptions and improper documentation of expenses. They may also ask to have payments made through third countries, which without sound commercial reasons. This may be where shell and offshore companies are being used. These are all red flags. And certainly you may also say that the information about third party is just not verifiable. Now I've known of instances where middlemen want to act as manufacturers and do act as manufacturers. These are middlemen. I have knowledge of turning up in a factory with a trading name above the door, only to turn up the next day at the very same building, the very same factory, with a completely different trading name on it. Now, you wouldn't have found that out if you'd just been talking. You need to do your due diligence on it. But what can we do about this type of thing? Next slide, please. Well, how do we assess and manage our third party risk? Well, certainly before engaging a third party, you should conduct sufficient due diligence based on your risk profile. You'll need to be proactive rather than reactive. You'll need to understand what risk level or appetite you're prepared to accept and certainly undertake a review of your third parties to see where the biggest risks are and develop your compliance program to fill and mitigate those identified risks. Understanding the scope of your due diligence is vital. And the amount of diligence should be proportional to the risks and red flags. Sometimes, sadly, this may mean the red flags are identified issues you have to walk away from third parties. Having adequate procedures in place is key to any compliance programme and is based on reasonableness and proportionality. And it has to come from the top, from the board, from the chairman, from the CEO. And it's got to be communicated throughout your organisations. And that includes training of staff so everyone in the organization can recognize where the problems could lie. And it needs to be continually monitored and reviewed. Next slide, please. Now, a good start of assessing your managing your third party risk is to provide the potential third party with a questionnaire to enable you to conduct the level of due diligence you have deemed appropriate, enabling you to identify any flags immediately. 
refusal or resistance to respond, it would always raise questions. This questionnaire would normally comprise company registration information, things like registration number, registered address, details of company directors, shareholders, and ultimate beneficial owners. Also, any previous issues they've encountered, whether that's regulatory, legal, or reputational, and certainly any adverse media they are aware of themselves. Now, I once had a South American company ask me to do a review on themselves to ascertain how the outside world saw them. This was a sound move. They previously had some issues with bribery and corruption and had actually changed their procedures and wanted to be able to alert suppliers to this, to face it up front. That was good for them. I've also known, sadly, of directors in, com in companies posting very, very unprofessional photographs onto personal social media. If it's on social media, it's open source, it's out there. What impression does that give of a company? Just think of the photographs you yourselves have seen on social media. Anything out there that can give a bad impression. So be very, very wary. I've also known companies purporting to be very large who after little research, find that their head office was no bigger than the garden shed. Likewise, companies where a simple Google Earth search of their premises with 20 branches showed them to be, showed them to be basically non-existent with the address that they give them. Now, it's commonplace to look at what prior experiences they have to provide the services, the expertise that you require. But are you also looking at what they're saying, for example, with their policies? You know, what policies and procedures do the third party themselves have in place to prevent corruption? I'll tell you now, it's very, very simple to buy policies online and stick them on a website. But you need to know, are they actually doing what they claim? Next slide, please. So what would I recommend to do? Well, a basic desktop review should include a review of the proposed third party to ensure they're registered correctly. Have a website, not any restricted parties list, and include an English language media search. This is commonly known in the profession as a level one or something similar. Further enhanced due diligence would include the previous plus searches of court documents, local language media searches, in-country documentation, verification of employment and educational history. This tends to be known as a level two or something similar. For the highest risk engagements, local boots on the ground enhanced due diligence may be required, which includes discrete inquiries being made of industry sources, employees, government officials, etc., along with obtaining references. This is in addition to the material set out previously and is known as a level three boots on the ground or something similar. Now the good news, and it is good news, this information is publicly available, so anyone can undertake it. It's open source information. It's there for anyone, so you can undertake it yourselves. Obviously, in certain circumstances, some information can only be obtained by paying for it. Some countries, you cannot access details of companies online and may need to have someone physically attend the registry offices. And some online registries are free, whilst others you have to pay for. Some, you actually have to be a resident or citizen to access the information. And some countries sadly do not provide details of criminal or court matters. Some in countries will only have information in the local language and please, please be careful using online translation services if you're going to this depth. Now the only real cost to you is time and resource. Now there are various paid for services that aggregate this information that companies offer but be very wary that purely online or purely platform-based services will have limitations, such as mentioned previously. Human analysis is vital in due diligence to give you the information you need. Now, there are many professional services providers like GWCI who can do all this for you for a fee. And for example, membership of the Institute of Export entitles you to a 45 minute chat to discover more. And there's also a discount available on reports. But please remember, if you're doing it yourself, privacy laws must be adhered to when conducting research. A key point to remember again, the information is available to access. It just takes time and knowledge as to where it can be found. Now, I've met many companies who want to keep control of this area themselves, or they feel too small to pay for platforms, or they don't have many due diligence inquiries in a year. And for this very reason, GWCI produced a due diligence toolkit, a DIY toolkit that offers links to many of the aforementioned sites overseas, and also an understanding of the methodology of due diligence and how to do it yourself for a small subscription. Now, I have a real passion for export, 
And I'm convinced more companies should be taking steps to export and to increase their exports if they're already out there. But fundamentally, I would never risk a company's reputation for the chance of a sale. A loss of reputation far outweighs the margins from a sale. At the end of the day, exporting is fun and should be an enjoyable challenge to make, but reputational risk for your business should be paramount to protect. In summary, due diligence is a necessity, not a wish, if you're wanting to protect your business's reputation. Now, I'm going to hand over now for questions, and also I believe there's a quick poll coming. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. That was a, a great overview of, sort of some of the various challenges obviously businesses can, can face around uh, kind of, um, you know, just dealing with people and dealing with different cultures, and, but also dealing with, you know, sometimes everyone in the national trade is, is going to be your best friend. So uh, some really important advice there and some great positivity as well. Really a passionate call for more businesses to, to do exporting, but with that reputational risk in mind. So thank you. That was a great, uh, really great overview there. Um, there's uh, more contact information about GWCI on the slide there. We'll be sharing the slides after the webinar. So if you if you want to, to make contact, then uh, you'll be able to see those details in the pack afterwards. But as noted on the next slide, we are going to do a quick poll. And this one's asking you, which of these do you currently undertake in your in your own due diligence process? So it might be none of the following, or it might be sanctions, checks and watch lists ultimate beneficial owners, adverse media criminal checks, discrete site visits and interviews. I'll leave that poll running for a minute or two. While people are answering that poll, we'll ask a question that we've received already. I'm going to ask it to, to Graham. Hi, Graham. How are you today? Yeah, hi, well, I'm very well. Thank you. Great stuff. Great to have, uh, great to have both of you with you. But the, the question, uh, both of you with us, sorry. Uh, but the question we've got is from Georgie. And Georgie asks, what should you do in the event that you've asked a supplier for information about their performance or processes relating to something like ESG or sanctions compliance, for example, but they refuse to share this information? Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, I think Simon touched on a few of the answers to, the, to, to that question particularly, but it's, um, in my opinion, that's the sort of thing that would actually raise some red flags with you and get you thinking, well, maybe um, something isn't quite right with this. The fact that the company hasn't been quite as open and honest in, in sharing that with you. Uh, but really, it's down to you as a company and you as an individual as to whether you decide that's a, a huge risk or whether it's a small risk to you. Because essentially, um, in, in not getting that information, we do take a risk and everything has a risk uh, matrix associated with it. Um, so you've got to ex decide whether you accept that or not. I suppose having a compliance framework in place would be my strong advice for you as a company to start with, because that can actually help you make that decision as to how big a risk that might be and in how big a challenge that might be going forward. Is it going to dent your reputation, as Simon said? Um, but so having that compliance framework already in place with your company can help you a long way towards making a decision on that. A red flag, though, simply suggests that you you probably want to investigate this a little bit further it, it, by being better informed as to why they've made the decisions that they've had, perhaps. That doesn't mean to say that every time you have to dig deep into the into the actual investigations, or it might be overt or whether it's confidential information, you certainly don't need to go there. And it needs to be proportionate and it needs to be appropriate to the, the sort of questions that you might have. And often policies like you've heard codes of conduct, environmental, modern slavery, or, or, or even simply a little bit about the history of the company. Surprisingly, most of that is advertised on company websites. Uh, and therefore, you can you can have a look at that yourself and you can actually see what they're saying about their company. I suppose the question at the end of the day then is, is, is do they match what the company claims? And do they operate in a positive ethical manner? And that's where the checks and balances that you need to do might come in but as Simon said again in the presentation you can do a lot of this sort of information and checks yourself um, it is freely available and it is readily available if you simply know where to look uh, you can check if the company appears on any sanctions or watch list or any of the official sites and there's a lot of those available that you can do that um, and again you can take adverse media checks on social media very simply these days it's surprising what people put on their LinkedIn on their Facebook on their Twitter or they might have written some newspaper articles about them there could be some blogs or articles you find them everywhere basically 
and it doesn't take much to actually go and have a look at those and see what other people might think of your company and answering the question as to hmm, are they a bona fide company are they um are they as legitimate as they say they might be uh, you might be able to check things like Glassdoor or the equivalents of or Trustpilot or why not talk to employees of the company or companies that have worked with that company that you might be able to glean some information on. Uh, quite simply that information can be really useful and actually give you an insight as to who you're dealing with and why they're actually being not quite as transparent as you'd hope them to be. Um, so you know we've actually as Simon said we just finished writing a guidance manual on this and I mean it's a, a meaty document here that we've just written actually which is a guidance document to help you uh, find your way through that so it's a DIY guidance document to actually um, uh, answer all of those sorts of questions it's full of tips and in, in, in how to proceed and how to find out this sort of background information that you can do yourself very simply too much to go through today I feel but does that give you a rounded answer to your question? I hope it does. I, I think so. Yeah, thank you. Very com comprehensive answer. I mean, it's uh, being proportionate, but yeah, you, 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 having those red flags there uh, so that you can kind of implement those checks and balances seems like a, some very good advice. Just going to very quickly share the results to the poll. Uh, so, I mean, a, a large proportion of people are do, using sanctions checks and watch lists uh, to mm. currently undertake their due diligence process. I guess that's maybe not too surprising in a post-Ukraine uh, world, but it, I mean, is, is that about what you would have expected or is it slightly different? Yeah, I, I'm sort of looking, looking at that. The sanctions uh, when watch lists, it, it's very topical, as you say, at the moment. So it's not surprising that everybody's looking at that and has an interest in that. And that, and that's good to see that that that, that is there. I, I'm perhaps a little surprised. It's perhaps as low as that. It's 74%. I might have expected to be even higher than that. Um, and ultimate beneficial owners is also a key issue here. There's so many people have come unstuck by not actually. I mean, I've I've actually written reports on companies where they didn't know who the beneficial owner was, and therefore they were actually paying the wrong company. Believe it or not. So I think, again, that, that's an area that I'd have expected to see a little bit higher. Address media, criminal checks, again, absolutely key, really, because uh, that can give you so much information. So it's good to see that 37% are actually looking at that. Um, so that, that's good. Discrete site visits and interviews. Yeah, I, I think if you've got that, that um, sort of relationship with that, that business, or that you can actually ask directly, then there's nothing better than that. But discrete site visits are quite often more difficult to achieve but as i said there are some easy ways of getting that like through glassdoor or talking to imp previous employees or or companies that, um, that have worked with them so i have to say that polls come out fairly close to what i've expected terrific well thanks graham for reflecting on it and on answering the question there as well from uh, from Georgie. Uh, thank you everyone for responding to the poll and thank you simon as well for that first presentation but on the next slide conscious of time. Simon and Graham will be back with us later for a bit of Q&A towards the end, but uh, we're now going to start looking at the world of insurance and helping businesses manage risk. And it's my delight to hand over initially to Angela Irvine from the Betchley Group to kick off this part of the session. So over to you, Angela. Thanks, Will, and good afternoon, everyone. The Bletcher Group were recently appointed as insurance partners to the Institute, and we're delighted to be able to take part in today's webinar on managing risk. It was interesting to hear from Simon and Graham about the role of due diligence in reducing risk. Businesses that engage in international trade can also mitigate commercial risks and protect their interests um, through various forms of insurance. Um, we were talking marine cargo, political risks insurance, cyber, um, contingent business interruption, uh, trade credit, um, and supply chain disruption insurance. And as you can imagine, trying to condense everything that we can do in the realm of insurance to help members um, into a 20 minute slot is quite impossible. Um, but I'm sure we'll cover some of those topics in future sessions. At Bletchley, when we work with a client, we take the time to fully understand the challenges and exposures that that business faces on a day-to-day -day basis. Having a robust risk management programme in place not only ensures that we can obtain the best insurance terms for that client on the market, but it's also reflected in the premiums that are ultimately paid. It's key, therefore, that the client and the broker work together 
to identify where the exposures lie and what can be done to mitigate the risk of loss or interruption, particularly when reliance on a certain supply chain. At Bletchley, we work with a panel of insurers and I've brought one of our partners along with me today. But we're not going to talk about insurance product specifics because as I've said, that, that's so broad. But we're going to focus on risk management and business resilience. So I'm pleased to hand over to Vicky and Nandi from ZRS. Next slide. Thanks, Angela. And next slide. <laughs> Good afternoon. And uh, the Thanks. next one, Phil, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm Victoria Gibson. I'm here with my colleague, Namdi uh, Huchigo from Zurich Resilience Solutions. Apologies for the lack of video. We are here, but we're having some uh, compatibility issues with the webinar. Um, so you, you won't be able to see us, I'm afraid. Just as a brief introduction, um, ZRS Zurich Resilience Solutions, we are part of the larger Zurich family. We are, this is a branch, we are an independent risk management consultancy providing risk and resilience solutions across the range of um, disciplines to a range of sectors and industries. Um, and the next slide will just show the agenda really briefly. Um, so we're going to be having a look at um, resilience, organisational resilience, what it means and how can you achieve this in this uh, somewhat turbulent risk environment. Um, the next one, thank you. So what do we mean by resilience? Um, my favourite term is bounce back ability. There's lots of good dictionary definitions. We can't ever prevent everything going, anything going wrong. So you can put in many plans and risk management processes into place uh, as possible, but something will always turn up uh, which catches you out. And resilience is the ability to adapt, to respond and adapt and recover. Um, and the key components to organisational resilience are enterprise risk management and business continuity management. Um, not sure if they're on the uh, slide there, Phil, don't know. Thank you. Um, and we, we have these in place to protect our valuable assets and the key elements. So our people operations, uh, processes, uh, reputation, et cetera, and finances, obviously. Um, next slide, thank you. Um, so how resilient are you? That's that's not a catch out question and it's not the question on the poll, uh, which we thought about asking, but there's, there'll be a different question coming up in a moment. And lots of businesses think, yes, we're resilient because we we cope when things turn up. We wing it, one of my favourite terms. I've worked for many organisations who are very good at winging it. Um, and is that down to good luck or good management? And should it be down to good planning? Winging it can be fine. It's a sign of strong leadership um, and good, good reflexes, good, reacti good reactivity. But there's benefits to having more formal and robust processes in place, such as offering um, increased stakeholder assurance internally. So making sure your, your staff and your managers and your board uh, are assured that you know what you're doing and you have plans in place. Also externally, so for example, audits, or when you're applying for grants or funding, investment, if you're looking to enter new partnerships, so following on from what Simon was talking about and your due diligence, a lot of people are going to expect you to be able to articulate your risk register and your contingency plans. And if you don't have those in place and ready to go, you may think you're resilient, but it's whether you can evidence that to the people who are important. So having Evidence that you can anticipate your risks and disruptive events. Can you prepare for them, respond to them and recover from them? Uh, next, thanks, Phil. Um, the risk landscape, is it static or dynamic? It's not really a proper question at the moment. In my 20 years of being a risk manager, I have to say the last sort of five years or so have, um, have been unprecedented. We've seen more big ticket items coming over the horizon than probably in the last 15 years um, previous to that combined. But does your risk management process match up to that dynamism? So a lot of people think we've got a risk register, so we must be doing it okay. But when did you actually last actively 
horizon scan for the big ticket items that might be coming up in the next five years. Um, when did you last update your business impact analysis? Do you know what your current critical activities are and your your priorities for recoverment for recovery? How about your employee well-being? Is recruitment and retention a risk for you at the moment? Um, is is a is a look at that? Uh, could that be beneficial for you? Your supply chain risks. We're going to be talking about supply chain uh, in a little bit more detail in a moment. And when did you last hold a uh, scenario-based exercise which actually tests stress tests your planning assumptions and updates your plans on the basis of that? Um, next one, thank you. Yeah, we see a lot of um, the the inevitability. Well, it won't happen to us. We can't really do much about it. Um, and asking people what they think their top risks are is always a really interesting question. And there will be a poll coming up at the end of this section. Um, so have to start thinking about that now. What you think your top risks are? Um, always a good question. What the, what the top risks are at the moment, but also. Why are they your top risks and which of those are your biggest risks, which have the biggest impacts, which might be the most likely risks to happen? Um, always important and often overlooked. Um, different ways to identify a risk. Some people use a formal structure like the pestle or the steeple methods, very, very well known, tried and tested. Some people prefer to do uh, a, a less formal method and think about all the all the aspects internal and, and external which might be making your business risky currently in the in the environment so is it things like your demographic is it the customer demand is it suppliers is it um, a number of different things is it getting getting funding post brexit are all those things making your business more risky at the moment and to achieve resilience, you need to understand more about why you've identified a risk and why that risk is important to you. So I have risk conversations on a weekly, if not daily basis with organisations and frequently hear things like, uh, oh, our biggest risk is health and safety. Our biggest risk is supply chain. My response to that is health and safety is not a risk. That is something that you should have in place. Uh, your supply chain is probably something that you you have to some extent. Uh, so we try to drill down to help people to understand why they are identifying something as a risk. So thinking about what's the context, what's going on, why is that theme a risk for us? What is it that could actually happen and what would the consequences be? Uh, and I always reiterate to people, acknowledging it, thinking it's a risk or putting it on a risk register is not the same as managing it. You have to have review and update it has to be a dynamic process and you have to have actions and accountability so do you think cyber or supply chain are your top risks because they're in the news every day are they actually applicable to you um, next slide thank you so at this point i'm going to hand over to my colleague namdi who's going to flesh out those thoughts a little bit more in the context of supply chain and supply chain risks so over to you namdi Thank you very much, Vicky, um, and also to the to the rest of the pan panelists. Um, good day to everybody that's on the call. So I'm going to take the next couple of slides, and I'm going to talk about um, uh, risk articulation and risk mitigation, and specifically around around supply chain. I think it's very important to maybe just um, highlight a a misconception about supply chain responsibility with, within organisations. So in in organisations, supply chain responsibility is is very wide and very um, and there's a slight misconception that the responsibility for supply chain lies with the procurement and, and the logistics teams. Um, my personal view um, is that um, anybody that's involved um, or that has a function uh, to play in fulfilling a customer need within an organization is has some level of supply chain responsibility. Um, I mean, even insurance risk managers, um, they have to be consulted and they have to be informed on key supply chain decisions so that they can take appropriate risk transfer strategies in the form of insurance, um, some of which Angela has already mentioned um, in, in her section of the webinar, you know, things like contingent business interruptions, uh, things like trade uh, disruption insurance, um, all which can be impacted by supply chain risk. So when we start to think about how we articulate uh, supply chain risks, it's also, also good to note that supply chain risks have always been 
prevalent. You know, having worked in industry myself for 20 odd years, we, you know, it's always been, a, we've always been in a situation where we've had to manage some form of supply chain risk in one shape or the, or the other. The difference with where we are today is that in the last three years, there have been various events that have magnified the, um, the impact of, of supply chain risks. So from Brexit to the pandemic, um, to the geopolitical war, um, and everything is, uh, has, has caused a, a snowball effect with the with the with the impact of supply chain risks and how it's affecting organizations i mean i personally back in 2020 um with the onset of brexit i had to quickly become an expert in in customs and and um, uh, import and export procedures for the company that i worked for at the time to ensure that we were able to move goods in and out of the eu um otherwise uh, our entire supply chain would have come to a halt so it's really really important for supply chain professionals um to be able to identify and quantify the risks in their uh, organizations. Unfortunately, sometimes this is just a, a, a reactive approach to risk uh, rather than a proactive approach. Um, um, and it, it's not a fault of the professional. Sometimes there's an issue of resource. They don't have enough resource to sort of manage that um, issue or challenge um, with being able to be proactive with, with risk articulation. But some of the things that we tell our clients and, 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 and um, organizations that we work with is that you have to um, first and foremost understand what the problem is within your organization and why that problem is happening. Um, you also need to understand what different scenarios that could pose to your organization in terms of how would this impact your value chains, your bottom line, um, your ability to be able to satisfy your end customers, um, uh, which transpires into the sort of consequences that you see as a result of these risks. risks. So just to put it into context, we, I'm just using an example um, of a situation where you have a key or a sole supplier, and majority of organizations have this situation where they have um, somewhere in the supply chain, there's that one single supplier that the company is, is reliant on, either through attrition um, or various impacts on the supply chain that has led to, to, to the fact that the organization can only rely on this one uh, particular supplier. Um, now, the question is the supply chain professionals need to ask themselves is, how likely is this to, hap how likely is this to happen to me within my organization? How bad would the impact be? Um, and what is the future landscape of that? situation of, of having a, 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 a key or a sole supplier um, within within the organization. If that supplier fails, what does that mean? Does that mean that we can't manufacture any, anymore? Does that mean we can't provide um, a, a service? And that's when you need to start to look at the impact and the likelihood. Obviously, with increasing impact, it's a bigger risk to the organization. And with in increasing likelihood of that risk occurring is also equally a large impact um, on the organization. And then the consequences, again, when that supplier fails, it could lead into reputational damage. It could um, mean a loss of business because you can't supply your customers, they go elsewhere. Um, and ultimately financial financial losses for, for the organizations as, as well. So what do organizations need to do to start to sort of look at these risks and, and how do they approach, how they deal with the risks? So um, I've just put some few examples there. You can either tolerate the risk, knowing that um, there are other potential options that you can start to look at to mitigate that risk. Um, you can treat the risk. Um, you can transfer it through, through, through insurance means, um, or you can terminate your um, relationship with that supplier and look for an alternative supplier. Um, and then in some situations, um, risks always pose a, uh, they, they're not always negative risks. You could have a situation where you have a positive risk, where that risk presents an opportunity to the organization and you take that opportunity um, and it provides um, an improvement to the organization. And I'll give an example um, of when I worked in the automotive world and um, there was an issue with semiconductor chips availability, um, worked with a company uh, to redevelop and uh, innovate the product that they had, which meant that they started to use less uh, semiconductor chips um, within that product. Um, so they were able to reduce cost in that product and they were able to supply quicker to their customers and add, you know, provide more value and outstrip a lot of their uh, competitors as well. Because with that innovation, it meant that the, the, the impact of semiconductor supply was quite minimal to that organization. Um, so next slide, please. 
So once you've articulated the risk, um, the next step is sort of the, the mitigation of the risk. So again, stick, stick into the example around the key source supplier failure within the organization. First and foremost, it's key to understand the reasons why that failure happened. Was it due to a breakdown in the relationship with the supplier? Um, was it a regulation or a legislation change that led to um, the supplier not being able to provide uh, goods to yourselves anymore. Um, I think uh, GWCI have, 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 have mentioned about the various types of legislation that's, that's coming into, uh, potentially coming into effect. The CS um, Triple D is, is currently being negotiated in, in, in the European Parliament and will potentially affect a lot of supply chains. The German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act is already here uh, and, and, and currently being enforced. Um, and all sorts of other potential um, impacts on, on, on the supplier from industrial action to um, fuel shortages, cyber attacks, insolvency, and then, and then the, th the threat of uh, a competitor um, advantage. Um, and these could all be, um, this is obviously not an exhaustive list, um, but there could be other um, issues and reasons why that supplier has failed. So in, in organizations, you may have current existing controls which um, are in the form of a, a, a supply relationship manage, management process, which means that you have a good, uh, or you try to maintain a good supplier relationship. Um, you have contracts in place with, with that particular key supplier, um, and then you have uh, regular contract reviews in place as part of your supplier relationship management process. But is that enough to, to sort of manage that risk and mitigate that risk to the organization? And this is something that organizations have to evaluate and pick out what, it, what is the best strategy for them from a, a supply chain risk management and control perspective. Now, again, we've just put some details around further actions that companies can take. Um, again, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is just based on our experience in the insurance world and, and having worked in industry. Some of further actions that could be taken are um, around um, having um, the right supplier code of conduct in place and having the suppliers sign up to this. Um, increased visibility within your um, supply chains beyond tier one um, and the various ways of doing this through supply chain mapping and the, and the use of AI solutions. Um, work with a third party um, and also in-house um, carry out supply chain risk assessment processes. Um, review your current red flag procedures um, or sometimes you know, known as whistleblowing um, just to ensure that you have a compliant um, supply chain um, that's um, relatively free of, of fraud, bribery, and corruption. Uh, business continuity plans, as Vicky mentioned earlier, um, ensure that these are robust, ensure that these are tested, um, and then also um, employ what we call multi-sourcing or dual sourcing so that you have alternative suppliers. It's a strategy that doesn't always work, but sometimes um, it's valuable to have that um, mitigation in place um, in the event that you, you have a failure um, of your existing supplier. Sometimes some organizations look to acquire, um, they, they look to either uh, vertically integrate uh, with a supplier partner or horizontally integrate um, uh, with a customer um, to sort of manage any potential risk that they may see in the supply chain. Um, and then the final point and that I, I wanted to make here was about the future of risk. So um, risks, supply chain risks within organizations, they require constant e evaluation. Um, as situations will change within your organization on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, things are evolving in, in, in majority of supply chains. So carrying out the exercise about artic articulating your risk and putting mitigation in place is not just a one-off exercise. It's a continuous process. And, and a lot of organizations get caught out based on this concept. They carry out the risk mitigation um, initially, and then things change um, by attrition within the supply chains, and then they're not able to catch up because they haven't re-evaluated their mitigation plans or re-evaluated the, the, the potential risks um, within the supply chain. Um, and again, just giving some examples of, of how the future of your supply chain risk profile may change. Um, this may be because of operational changes, um, this may be because of, of the sustainability goals that are coming um, in the future uh, within the EU and potentially the UK, um, a change in, in demand profile um, from your customer base, um, again, legislation, a key key factor, and then the organization's strategic objectives may change um, as well. And this is why I always advocate, not for selfish reasons, but I always advocate that as a supply chain professional, 
um, we should always have a seat, uh, a seat in, um, in, in the leadership um, discussions and st strategic developments within an organization because of how important it is to, to, to that organization. Um, and yeah, finally, you know, as I hope I've sort of articulated quite well, you know, how supply chain risk is important to organizations and some of the steps that you may take towards mitigation. Um, um, and this explains why there are a lot of supply chain professionals that are very busy um, in industry at, at the moment. Um, so next slide, um, I'll pass back to, to, to Vicky on the next slide and she can summarize and uh, we'll move on to questions as well. Thanks, Nandi. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just a, just a few of our very high level thoughts around organisational resilience there and this uh, hugely changing risk landscape at the moment. And obviously, we, we haven't drilled down really into any of those topics. Um, so just to summarise that, I mean, like Simon said at the beginning of his session, you know, when you when you've been around in this environment for a while, I've heard it all. I've heard It'll never happen to us. We don't have time. We don't have money. We don't have the people. We don't have the buy-in. They're all excuses. There are no real reasons not to start the risk management uh, process um, and, and help to become resilient. Um, and it can be a very simple process to get started. Um, it's really important, as Namdi was just articulating there, to, to make sure it is a dynamic process. It's not an end-to-end -end linear process. It should never end. Uh, it should always be under constant review and thinking about the risks that are going to slow you down or stop you from achieving your objectives that's always your starting point or going back to taking the opportunity are there risks there which could which could speed you up to achieving your objectives what's the future of that risk is your operating environment changes in your business process and your objectives say for example your growth strategy or your exit strategy how does that how does that risk going to change in the in that context guidance and support is always available you can start with your insurer you can start with your broker you can start with organizations like the people on this call we're always happy to have a, a free completely free no obligation chat with anybody to start to understand um, what they might need in terms of becoming risk 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 uh, risk robust and resilient um, and just to reiterate the worst thing that you can do absolutely the worst thing you can do is is nothing um, so I think that's it from myself and Namdi. Um, happy to open the floor to any questions, if Angela's got anything to add at this point. Uh, no, I think that's uh, we're a bit tight on time, so thank you. Um, I think it's back to Will um, for a poll and some questions, maybe? Absolutely, me, thank you. Uh, so next slide, there's just uh, some of the contact details and more information about Vicky and Namdi. Uh, this is just the next slide, Phil. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you both, both of you, all three of you for that presentation there. Some real important points there. Uh, being proactive will you know, help you be more bounce backable, if that's the word, and ringing it is probably understandable, but not, not the best way of doing it. And I think Namdi, probably you spoke for a lot of people in this call when you said that people had to very quickly become customs experts uh, in the lead up to Brexit. So great, uh, great to hear from all three of you. We are gonna do a poll and ask, ask a, go through a couple of your questions. Uh, so this one is, as alluded to earlier, what is the top risk currently on your strategic risk register? register? Options might be financial, climate change, supply chain, other, or you don't have a risk register. Uh, if you do say other, please do type in in the chat or the question function uh, what your other would mean. Uh, certainly cyber was mentioned earlier in one of the slides. We've had a, there's a few others there as well. So do feel free to, to type in what other it means for you. Just while people are answering that poll, uh, Angela and team, we've had a question from Poppy. It's it's a really, quite a broad one, but it's an important one to cover because it's probably what a few people are thinking right now. And Poppy asks, risk management appears pretty daunting. How do you get started? Uh, Angela, do you want to start on that one? Yeah, uh, it, it is. A, it's a good question. Um, and I think we've we've kind of covered it in, in what we've been saying this afternoon. Um, First things first, you have to create a risk register. You have to literally list everything that is a risk to your business. Um, it could be from you know, risk to the premises, um, a risk to the labor, a workforce. Um, we, you know, we mentioned recruitment and, 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 and shortages and, and whatnot, regulation, supply chain. But for as long as it's all in one place, and then you can prioritize 
because you know depending on resources um if you get get it in some kind of list you can start to tick them off i don't know if the other two want to add anything to that that's a great answer angela i will add one thing um which is it can be daunting and there's an awful lot going on in the world at the moment and people can get overwhelmed by thinking there are so many risks where do i start um, and I would say, just consider what are the actual risks to you. So if something doesn't affect your own business objectives, it may not need to be a risk. So there's plenty of things going on, but always bring it back to your own objectives and what you're, what you're trying to achieve. Uh, it's a good starting point to start to encapsulate those risks. Agreed. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just reiterate what Vicky said, you know, just to, just to add to that, I'll just say start, start small and and scale up as you as you go along thank you thank you all three of you uh some, some really great tips uh, and hopefully that's been useful poppy i'll just share the results to the poll uh this isn't maybe not too surprising given obviously we are the institute of export and international trade our audience is usually going to be more supply chain oriented uh, particularly international supply chains but 50 percent say supply chain followed by financial 19 percent uh, only five percent climate change at this stage is that is that surprising at all? I, I don't know, uh, Victoria, maybe, I think you alluded to this poll earlier. Is that what you'd be expecting from this sort of audience? I'm not surprised to see supply chain there. Um, we didn't put cyber in as an option. I don't know whether people are putting cyber in the, in the chat maybe as a response. Uh, financial is not really a surprise. Um, and obviously that's quite a broad, all encompassing risk theme. Climate change, quite surprised to see that um, so low. Um, it would be interesting to drill down into that a little bit, um, whether people are not seeing, whether, whether it's just dropping off the radar a little bit with everything else that's going on. That is a trend that we're starting to see on risk registers. Um, we would just add that, you know, the, the general consensus is that it's not going away. And it, the, the problem with long-term risks, those very strategic long-term risks is that it can be uh, seen as less important there's less immediacy but they will catch up so it's a good idea never to sort of take your eye off the ball completely with those those big ticket ones mm. yeah just also to add to that i think um, i equally am surprised that supply uh, well not surprised at supply chain but equally surprised that climate change is not quite quite high up there on that list um reason being is obviously there's a lot of um climate change going on at the moment and um, we use an example of a, a, a customer that we work with that we 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 look at the supply chains and, we, and they look after a large amount of ports um, within um, within the country um, and, and outside of the country. And we do a lot of assessments, um, climate uh, resilience assessments of those ports as well, because those ports are very important for the movement of, of goods in and out of the, uh, in and out of the countries. Um, um, and it's all around how they can build climate resilience um, as well. And then when you think about a logist from a logistics perspective as well, goods are moving on a daily basis, either by road, by rail, by land. And obviously there's adverse effects of the weather. Um, and looking outside right now, it's raining quite heavily. So that, you know, it's also impacting how logistical routings can be impacted uh, from a supply chain perspective by the change in, in, in climate. So climate's a big one. Um, um, and it's something that I think supply chain professionals need to, need to start to uh, uh, embrace in terms of a significant risk or impact to, to the way they work. Thank you, thank you. And I guess the limitation of the poll is that we said what's your top risk, uh, top top risk, but actually a lot of these presumably will intersect to some extent as well. So um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that changes over time. Uh, just on the next slide, we'll do, uh, we're, we're very short on time, so we'll only do two questions. Um, so apologies for overrunning slightly. A uh, question I'd like to put uh, to GWCI, welcome back very, very briefly. I've had a few people asking about uh, kind of how companies can find online information about uh, third party companies overseas. So you had a mm. question from Ashley said, is there a restricted party list in particular you would recommend? And a question from Violet who said, is Dun & Bradstead still a reliable source for company checks? Uh, Graham, do you want to take that question? Um, yeah, sure. Um... So let's start with the Dun & Bradstreet one to start with. I mean, Dun & Bradstreet, uh, you have to recall, is, is, is probably used by quite a lot of the people who are listening in on this today. 
they're using it for financial checks against businesses particularly um but because the only limitation of the dunning bradstreet uh, that i've found and we've used it ourselves actually in our business is that that um of course it's it it, 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 uh, it it relies on the businesses themselves to input the information in the first place so it's so there could be potentially quite a few errors there um in it, it often it may be not up to date quite and often the information that's put onto that is is often wrong um not to say that that's not extremely useful it's a good good uh, platform to check things very quickly but i have to say for us we always go back to the uh, official documentation and the sources of that information so that's whether that's a government or whether it's a registry office or to find out exactly who directors are at that particular time it may be that your directors have changed overnight it may be that um, the company has changed its name it may be that it's registered to a different address uh, these things happen very quickly indeed and if you want the correct information i would suggest it's always best to go back to the absolute source of that information thanks um, you thank you uh, sorry uh, thank you Dan. sorry yeah okay Actually, sorry, there's, there's the second part of the question, which is about denied party lists. You want to just quickly touch on that, and then I'll just do one more question. Uh, so, 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 so yes, I, I mean, to actually understand where these registration documents you might find and where these listings are, um, there's there's a number of sites in, in in locations that you can get this information from. And so, um, really, in answering that question, there are, there are a number of locations that you can get that, but there's just too many to go through now. I mean, again, that's the sort of thing so we. We put into our documentation with tips and ideas we, we actually give websites etc that people might want to look at and actually get that information directly for themselves um so so yeah it's a difficult one to answer at the time that we've got unfortunately thank you thank you graham um yeah we're very much everyone so i do one last question just saw the the bletchley and uh, gr uh, zrs uh, gang just before we finish um so the question is um comes from Harry, who says during the pandemic, obviously there's a lot of new supporting around force majeure clauses and kind of companies struggling to use insurance um, because of the kind of act of God nature of the pandemic. And his question is sort of it kind of has the insurance industry, how has it responded to those those changes? And kind of I, I guess it's, it's a quite a broad question, and maybe the answer is we we'll have to do another webinar on it. But um, Angela, I'll throw back to you just to. Uh, yeah, I think uh, on the basis for overrunning, I, I'm going to keep this really brief because otherwise I could I could talk for hours on on mm. the pandemic and business interruption and, and and what's been going on with the High Court and 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 whatnot. Um, I suppose a, a, a brief answer is um, that when you've got policies like supply chain disruption insurance um, and, and, and marine, um, they will cover force majeure um so you know um hurricanes um extreme weather you know all of those things you know that will be picked up um with a lot of claims especially around business interruption there has to be property damage for a business interruption claim to 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 be successful so i think um at the time of the pandemic for example whilst a lot of businesses were interrupted um there was no property damage claim um, and therefore the business interruption claim was not successful. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if Angela's frozen or I've, oh yeah, so I think we may have lost Angela briefly there. Um, as noted, this is something we will revisit in a future webinar. So. Um, apologies if the answer was a little, a little bit short and apologies for overrunning as well, but on the next slide, uh, I think we will have to start wrapping up. So I would like to once again, uh, so Andrew, I think you're back, but I think that the connection's gone a bit funny. So we're going to have to start wrapping up at this stage. But um, yeah, we will revisit that in a future webinar. Um, thank you, very, uh, everyone, for, to our speakers for, for joining us today. Uh, Simon and Graham from GWCI, Angela from the Bachelor Group, and Nandi and Victoria from Zurich Resilient Solutions. A lot of information there, and I hope we've been able to give a decent overview of the challenges faced by businesses trading internationally when trying to understand and manage the risks that are out there around the world. Before we go, uh, just a very quick plug on the next on this slide, uh, a great opportunity for anyone involved in international trade. We're running an inaugural Import Export Awards competition this year with an opportunity for those involved in trade to be recognized by the industry in one of nine categories which are shown on the screen. 
Winners will be celebrated at a fabulous awards dinner on 15th November in central London, which really will be a must attend event for anyone in this industry. Do get involved and you can find out more information about how to enter the awards and attend the industry guarded dinner on the regular Institute website and also on the URL included on the slide. Our next webinar is currently scheduled for September and that's going to be on the Electronic Trade Documents Act, the landmark legislation paving the way for trade authorization that recently received Royal Assent and which enters into force this autumn. Details of that webinar will shortly be posted on our website, export.org.uk. A reminder, we will be sending the slides and, record, uh, the slides and the recording of today's webinar in a follow-up email, which you should get in the next day or so. Please do get in touch if for any reason this email doesn't come through to your main inbox. But thank you again, everyone, for joining us for today's webinar. As you leave, please do let us know what you thought of today's session and any suggestions for topics in future events by completing the short exit survey. Apologies we ever ran, but this is very much the start of our coverage on this uh, broad topic. So keep your eyes peeled for future webinars on this, uh, on this uh, topic which we covered today. But now, goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>